I'm Andrew Kirkpatrick. I'm, I guess, DevOps, SRE, platform engineer type person. <laughs> and I'm here to talk to you about kind of a project that came up at my last job where we had to centralize some legacy authentication and authorization at the Ingress Gateway. So kind of wanted the, to put the problem statement in perspective. So imagine kind of typical older system. So everything used to be really simple, right? So you'd have a bunch of users that log into a system. You'd kind of assign them a role like editor, administrator, moderator, something like that. And then, you know, you'd go on their way. But then as these kind of monoliths turned into modular monoliths, ended up being distributed systems made up of, you know, microservices in service oriented architecture, some of these users get multiple roles or some of the users end up in groups. And some of those groups then have permissions bolted to them themselves. And then perhaps you've got different types of services with different types of permissions. Now you've got ACLs for different objects. So it gets really complicated, right? So you end up with authentication and authorization information kind of all over these different parts of your monolith or distributed systems. So kind of some of the three more common approaches, and obviously like there's so many different ways to skin this cat, but some of the common approaches you'll see in the wild is you kind of like centralize your auth service and put it as kind of like the gatekeeper to everything in your infrastructure. So it sits in front, it decides whether you do or don't get through and then communicate to other services from there. Alternatively, you could run that service inside and then you communicate to it from each of your individual services, which has pros and cons for scalability, reliability, but it does then mean you have to get the people that are responsible for those services to implement that auth each and every time. And then, of course, one option, one thing that I've seen at one place is you implement a client-side library that communicates to shared authentication and authorization data stores, which gets horribly complex to manage. So I'm going to be talking about how you can do it at the Ingress Gateway. So we run a standalone service. It talks to your kind of Ingress Gateway or proxy, and then you make calls out to this now standalone service, and then that kind of acts as your gatekeeper for all of the services or monoliths, modular monoliths that sit behind. So to kind of summarize what we're going to talk about, so why wouldn't you just use something off the shelf? Kind of the most common question that I got asked for that project. Um, how would you identify and categorize what kind of authentication types you want and need to use based on your code base? Um, what kind of information, once you've authenticated, would you want to send to downstream services? So it's all good and well identifying what user and what roles, permissions they have, but how do the other services that sit behind the gateway then interpret and understand that. And then at what point do you actually handle the authorization for this? So I'm just talking about authentication and identities. What do you do with the like granular permissions that people may or may not have? And then how do you actually run that standalone next to your gateway? So got a practical example. I'll be kind of whipped through that really, really quick. Don't want to keep people from lunch. And then just to summarize. So most common example is why why wouldn't you just use something off the shelf? Why can't I just helm install something from the community and go? So there's two problems there. A lot of them assume that you have no users. So I'm gonna set up a new identity pool. Here are the authentication mechanisms that I support. So like go nuts. And like for, for a lot of people, that doesn't really apply. You're gonna have some set of users that you've already got. I mean, might not even be users, just a bunch of identities that you have and you've already probably got one or multiple in our previous case, authentication mechanisms in use. And you're kind of stuck with that. Like the customers that you've got, the clients that they use have to use these. So you're kind of going to have to roll with that and go along. Because if you don't, now you've got to say, okay, we're gonna migrate to this new authentication type. I'm gonna deprecate the ones that we've got. You need to upgrade your clients. You need to change how you do business with us. And in a lot of cases, that's honestly not practical or it will take years. If you, I mean, if you didn't, and you happen to have overlapping authentication types to say like, oh, we use API keys, so does this product off the shelf. Okay, how easy is that to deploy into your infrastructure? Do you have the necessary tech stack alignment? Like, can you just install it and off you go? Are there gonna be any kind of conflicts? A lot of potential things to consider. Um, and then is everything kind of backwards compatible with how you store your identity data at the moment? So given those kind of situations, um, how would you actually get that data, say, either out of your existing identity store and into the new one in terms of a one shot? Like if you can't directly plug it into their database or however they're storing identities, do you copy it over? Or do you try and kind of keep it in some kind of active synchronization? If you did try and keep it in sync, say if you're trying to synchronize something from 
a legacy system, LDAP, whatever it is, how often do, say, permissions change in that system? Is it sort of you can get away with a nightly sync or do like granular permissions for these users change every hour, every minute, every second? And what's the kind of risk of keeping like those users, those permissions, those roles in active sync? Like what's the chance that someone will end up with the incorrect permissions at any given time? It's entirely possible, but it's potentially risky. Um, we deemed it kind of not really suitable for our use case. So that kind of brings me to, all right, if that's given the case, how do we start breaking down what we've got at the moment? So there are lots of authentication mechanisms out there. This is just a, a tiny subset. Um, we ended up using, I think, five different ones, just kind of over the evolution of our platform when we had to move it. They were all built into our monolith. So it was kind of tricky to identify where they were being used. Code base was pretty big at the time. Um, so how might you actually kind of figure that stuff out? So we kind of underwent an exercise of, based on all the domains, subdomains that we've got, um, like which subdomains are being used for which endpoints, which authentication mechanisms are being used for those. So like if there's an admin subdomain, does it use a particular thing? If people are logging into a console, if people are using different versions of an API client, things like that. And then one kind of thing that I'll touch on in a bit is not necessarily different types of authentication represent the same kind of identity. So we had a bunch of endpoints that a user would log into, but the very, very early endpoints a company would authenticate against. And a company doesn't have a direct tie to a user. They just do things on behalf of like their whole company as a client. So that kind of presented some challenges. Um, moving on from sort of how you'd identify things, uh, how is this stuff kind of configured? So I'll kind of cover some examples of say how like um, Flask route decorators work, but depending on what CMS, framework, multiple products you're coming from, this kind of code or database calls or configuration could be set up in many, many different ways. So we, like I said, we ended up with five different authentication types we had to handle. We basically had to dig around, try and figure out what was going on, run a bunch of comprehensive testing, things like that. Um, luckily in our case, it was all Python based, but at a previous job, we were people were implementing things in multiple languages. So we had some authentication and like in that case the same authentication being done in java in scala some of it was being done in node um, so that was an example of us using the same authentication type in different languages um, around the place which was a nightmare to update and then the same kind of problem if you have the same code base doesn't necessarily mean it's just one that fits all so how would you kind of go about combining all of this stuff together so one kind of way that we went about it initially was, can you programmatically determine what kind of authentication you're using at any given point? So the top one is the subdomain example. So if you're using different authentication for administration endpoints, you might be able to target that by subdomain, by URL, by path. Um, you might want to handle content negotiation in terms of if different versions of your API, which is what happened to us. We had a V1 and V2 version of our API. Most of the endpoints were the same. Some were deprecated, used completely different authentication with slightly different identities under the hood. So that was a potential pain point. Um, and if that's not possible, one thing we had to do for some of it was just brute force. So basically go through like, here's all the authentication types they could be using for this. Let's just go through, try and figure it out. Has certain performance implications, but in some cases you might genuinely not know or be able to figure it out. So that's all good and well. So let's centralize this stuff, but what information would you send to these services now that you've got this magical centralized auth service? So how would you actually represent the identity data that you've got in some kind of consolidated format? So say you're loading it into an object or a struct. Does that look kind of roughly the same for all of the authentication types you're handling and in all the cases where that identity is being used? Is there a way that you can kind of represent it in some kind of common format? So say, could you encode that as a JSON object? Is it small enough, compact enough for you to be able to send that downstream and those services have a good enough understanding of what that identity is, what it means? Do they have enough info? Um, seeing as they're not going to be able to, not necessarily not going to be able to, but it then becomes cost expensive and problematic to then load that from the database yourself. Right? Like ideally you want to centralize this stuff so you're only doing it in, in one place and then can be sort of more aggressive with caching methodologies, things like that. So. A lot of the solutions that I'll kind of mention later, um, the ingress gateways themselves offer a solution where you can kind of add arbitrary data to headers. They get pushed downstream. So one common approach is you encode stuff as JSON or other kind of data, 
bolt those headers on at the gateway and then push that down. So in theory, then don't need to look it up again. Those services should be kind of set with all the information they need. So what that kind of looks as a, a real basic practical example. So you log in with HTTP basic, you pass that as a header, um, that hits the gateway. So the gateway just forwards those headers on. Usually it's sent without the body, but normally say things like basic request information like headers and path get pushed over to the auth service. You can decode HTTP basic easily. So let's run a SQL query, look up that user, look it up out of what is now hopefully say like a user database that you migrated to, read replica, write through cache, whatever. And then you essentially JSON encode user information that you loaded up, put it into a header, and then the gateway will send that downstream. So where this kind of gets tricky, and this got tricky for us, is is the representation, as I kind of mentioned, of users in your system consistent everywhere that they're used. In our case, it wasn't, kind of coming back to the company example. So some operations were done user agnostic, which if you're trying to consolidate into a single identity format, can be kind of tricky. Also, like, are they even being loaded up in the same way? In some cases, we had relationships missing, um, data missing, so just something to consider. So this is great in terms of how do I load my users up? How do I get the identities? But where do you actually handle the authorization for this? So I know who you are. Do I actually know if it makes sense for you to be able to access this particular endpoint? So the answer to that is kind of it depends and it's conditional. So as a general kind of rule for how a lot of these work, it's normally a true false type response from the auth service. So either I'm going to let you go to the downstream service that you requested, or I'm going to block you right now. Um, which is great, but then say, if you have a more complex system that handles a lot of like role-based ACL object permissions, does it make sense to migrate all of that stuff into a central service? Like in some cases, that's, that's not gonna be practical. So as a very simple example, you would say have the admin endpoint, you load up that user, the user has an admin role. Like, okay, well, as a pretty blanket statement, I can say if you're trying to go to an admin service or admin endpoints, like you have an admin role, I'm gonna let you through. Like that makes sense. Um, you have carte blanche, go wild. But say if you had a document service and you had like different roles for what you could do in that document service and different ACLs for each individual document that overwrote that, does it make sense to then build this auth service into this sort of giant, almost monolithic auth service itself? We gotta kind of handle like, you know, I, does it need knowledge of how documents work? Do you now, does it need to know knowledge of like how all of these other services work? So you kind of end up potentially tightly coupling the auth service to the implementations of the stuff that it's supposed to make simpler. So in this case, you'd say potentially, if you built a generic ACLs type system, load the ACLs into the auth service, have that data there and ready, but just push that downstream. So put that into the headers, let the document service or any other service determine what to do with that authorization information but not necessarily have it actually act on it. So say, okay, you're allowed to go through 200, okay. But here is information for you to make a more contextual based decision on whether you should or should not allow these users. And there's pros and cons to that approach, but that's kind of like where we sat on. We did some, but not all. So how would you actually run this? So a lot of the kind of common ingress gateways that are out there at the moment have this available as some kind of basic plugin service. So, um, most of my experience is with emissary ingress. So that's the example I'll go through today, but most of the common ones that you'll kind of come across that are cloud native, some not, provide you with some kind of mechanism to make this call out to this other service. And they all work in roughly the same way. So kind of how that looks in terms of a flow diagram. So you get headers, body, and a path for standard sort of HTTP requests that come into the gateway. That goes out usually without the body, but there are ways that you can send some through in the case of authentication mechanisms that need it. All service then gives you that allow or deny um, as a basic response back, and then we'll send through as configurable the headers that were originally sent, strip some, adds additional headers for more information, and then passes that to the downstream service. How that looks, say, with um, emissary ingress, so you have Kubernetes custom resource definition, you basically just call out and say, I want you to call this auth service in some or all cases, or I want to provide this centrally. Here are the headers I'm going to allow through. Here's the deny. Here's what I want you to do if it's denied. Um, here's the timeout settings, that kind of thing. 
And then it just sits and has a normal Kubernetes service. So it just sits behind and goes, I'm just going to respond like any other HTTP or gRPC API. In terms of a practical example, I'm going to show like a rough demo of how this looks. Um, so I built just a basic Flask application. So it uses route decorators, if anyone's familiar with that. So you basically just wrap the endpoint and go, I want you to perform some kind of basic auth on this before you send me through. And then that calls. In this case, I've written the auth service just as like a piece of code. So in this case, it's all within the same application. It just calls out and goes, all right, you sent through this API key. Does this user exist? If so, let them kind of see their orders in this example. Makes a call to the database, goes back, and then that all happens within same process, same container. So how that might look is you have like the key required, route decorator, and all that basically does is goes, I'm going to try and get the API key out of the headers, look up the user, and then good to go. If so, that user gets injected into the root, and then you just load those orders up from the order servers. So I'm looking for that API key. Really basic example. This isn't production-ready code, obviously. But I wanted to keep it fairly simple to read. So just I'm going to look for that key. If it's there, load the user up. And that's kind of, say, a fairly stock standard example of, OK, well, if I wanted to check their roles or permissions there onwards, you would do that from the user object that was loaded up. So how that might modify if you're going to run it as a centralized service. So the gateway makes a call out to the auth service, which now runs standalone. Um, so in my example, the exact same code is being called. That puts through the deny or allow. That ends up to another root decorator. This one instead just tries to pull the information that was sent in the headers downstream. And then that then shows the orders for that user. So it looks fairly similar, but we've got headers required decorator in this case. And that will essentially just go, I'm going to try and I assume that the auth service is authenticated at this point because it guards everything that I'm doing. If the user is in the headers and has been sent downstream, I'm going to pull it out and then pass that through. So the same authenticated user object essentially gets injected into the root and is available for use in the exact same way. So the actual contents of the root, the way that the order service works, is the same for both. And that was kind of what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that it's the same mechanism happening across the board. It's just how this actually happens and where it happens is the difference. So in this case, I'm just looking for the username and their ID. Um, these users are very simple. <laughs> the database is very simple. Um, and I'm literally just populating like a data object in this case. So the standalone service looks kind of very similar. So I'm running essentially the same function, authenticate the API key header, try and get that out, user database connection, look at that user. And then if I'm pulling that user back, bolt those two headers on, and then send 200. So kind of as I mentioned, the way XDorth works, it's either 200 or 400 something. So I either yes or no. So if I found the user, 200. If not, 401. And that's as bare basic as it gets. Um, obviously, you can do a lot more, but this is kind of the rawest that it kind of looks. So feeling brave, let's try and actually show this. So this is local Kubernetes cluster. I'm running emissary ingress, bunch of pods, and then I'm running three deployments. So three deployments, one pod each. And it's literally kind of as I described to you, one with such so a standard container that I built, all running the same image with different entry points. No smoke and mirrors, hopefully. Is that big enough? Hopefully that's big enough. Yeah. Yeah. So base endpoint is not authentic. Um, has no auth behind it. So I'm going to get a bunch of users and get their IDs out. Right, so hit that. So the top one is with auth. This is without. This is standalone. So nothing's happening. I have a couple mappings in MSRE Ingress to basically map API with auth, API with auth, and standalone auth to these different things. Yeah, getting these keys. And then I go to slash orders. And I'm not authenticated, right? So red text, 401, no API key was supplied. So pretty standard, right? So let's send that through. And now we get the orders for that particular user. And you can see API key was supplied. This user was found. And now I'm going to list the orders for this user. So pretty self-explanatory, right? Makes sense. <laughs> 
So let's try without. So same thing. The base root is not has no auth for it. You go through, you hit here, you see stuff coming out the second box. You'll also see, um, because everything is guarded by auth, that the standalone auth service gets a request every time. What you want it to do in those situations is going to be based on configuration and like how Emissary Ingress is configured to use it and how it's configured itself. But then if we go to orders, so you don't see any JSON body. You can configure the gateway to respond differently, but this isn't hitting the without auth service at all. But you'll see it comes out of standalone auth. So you're getting a 401 unauthorized at the bottom. This never reaches the downstream service. So the auth service in conjunction with the gateway blocks this before anything happens. So kind of similar to how plugins would work for rate limiting, DDoS, that kind of thing. That's essentially the same as what's happening here. So standalone auth service is doing all the work here. Then we plug our key in. And then you see essentially the same thing split between the two services. So here we've got, all right, headers were sent from standalone auth. I found this user, and I'm listing orders for this user. And you look down here, and you see API key was supplied, user was found, which is literally the same code as this. So that's kind of what I was trying to kind of demonstrate, that this is essentially running the same code split in between services. So hopefully that makes some kind of sense. Um, I've got GitHub repository up if anyone wants to take a poke around. Not the greatest code in the world, but yeah, there's kind of examples of this. It's somewhat annotated. Hopefully it makes sense. <laughs> so to kind of summarize, before we jump off and hopefully grab some more lovely food, you can use almost any kind of authentication to work with this. So if your application already handles it, if you've already got code that runs like this, in theory, you should be able to abstract it out. It's using the same kind of protocols and mechanisms that you would use otherwise. So most things should be compatible with this. Obviously, not. that's not a global truth. Um, to try and save the kind of CPU cycles and resources you're using, try and determine what kind of authentication types are being used in any given situation. So brute force is great if you really don't know, but try to be a little more kind of programmatic about it. Because one of the advantages, obviously, of declaring auth where it's being used is that's fairly efficient, and it's easy for developers to understand. But if you're going to move that somewhere centrally, if it's not in some kind of logical fashion, and ours weren't, with just things being named completely randomly, that, that can cause a bit of a problem. Um, think about how you want to pass that identity information down in any kind of standardized format. So that's going to be simpler than others, depending on how many different types of identities you've got and how you're using them. Um, consider how you want to represent some of that information. So if you're going to start loading up authorization information you want to send downstream, like is that a reasonable amount to send? Does it make sense to handle some of that separately? Does it make sense to split some of it? Tough to say. That is very kind of case by case specific, I think. Um, yeah, in terms of whether you handle authorization at the gateway or not. And then kind of the last and primarily SRE related point is now that you've kind of put this in the critical path, now you're going to need some pretty strong SLIs and SLOs around making sure that all service is available. So one of the advantages of running a a system centrally not at the gateway is you've got more durability for that. In this case, if that all service goes down, you either block all traffic to all services, which is terrible, or if you set it to be permissive, you're now just allowing people to get to endpoints they shouldn't be. So that's kind of one of the major downsides, I would say, of this. Like, There's a lot of advantages to doing it, but one disadvantage is this is, this is now as critical as anything that sits at the front of your infrastructure. Um, Brief plug for a company that allowed me to speak today. So I work for StackAdapt. We're a programmatic advertising platform. Um, handle a lot of challenges at scale and a lot of really, really high throughput. I think average RPS for the platform is 7 million per second. So a lot of unique challenges in terms of how we run things. So if anyone's interested, please take a look at our careers page. Um, otherwise, thanks very much for listening. I know it's very comfy chairs and getting to that time of day. So. Yeah, really appreciate you all coming along. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me on socials. Come find me here. Um, yeah, and the slides and code are all online. All right. Thanks very much. Any questions or is it too close to food? I have a quick one. Um, uh, have you come across any kind of 
uh, challenges with maybe long running connections, web sockets? We didn't at the time. <laughs> I think that's that's the caveat. Yeah. Um, I think that's yeah potentially going to mm -hmm. be kind of one of those cascading things, which things like tracing would be useful for. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, if you're going to have lots of long-standing connections that kind of sit, eat connections in the gateway, which then eats connections in your service, yeah, that's probably the kind of thing that can cause issues. But I mean, that's kind of also true of if you were running them conventionally. So mm. yeah, well, I meant more like because I guess. Uh, when you when you have to off local and, and where the uh, websocket would terminate, I guess you can kind of do that check. Like, do I still allow this? Like, yeah. six days later, um, uh, what has something changed? And I guess yeah, with the central off, I guess you still need enough information there to 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 make that call. I guess yeah, and that's what that's why I say like some porting some of this stuff over. I guess it, it does depend a lot. Mm. Like we didn't have a significant volume of web sockets for that to be a problem but yeah kind of to your example i could see how that would become an issue and you'd probably need more visibility of stuff outside of just purely identity data to kind of get that context of is this good is this bad um but that kind of yeah bleeds into realms of how much does it need to know how mm. context is where does it need to be yeah thank you cool. all right cheers um so here you you kind of wrote your own authentication like mechanism essentially but is it possible to plug in like like auth0 for example or like external providers of at the gateway level in um like it's a good question i mean we used auth0 for some other stuff this was kind of a very niche scenario i think in our case um so like we ripped out all of these authentication bits and pieces out of other bits of the code base. So it wasn't strictly like we wrote our own service, but all this code was kind of pre-existing. Um, I mean, could you tie it in in the same way? I don't necessarily know whether you'd work in conjunction with the gateway or if you'd want to sit in front of it and double up. Yeah, um, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> It'd be interesting to try. 